My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, the creator of the term FOMO, and I'm coming at you live from Advertising Week, New York. Remember the old saying about how you should never talk about politics, money, or religion? Well, we're gonna break that rule today. We're not gonna be talking about religion, but we will be talking about money and politics because the two oftentimes go together. We're also going to talk about how you can stand up and make noise and have your voice heard in our democracy. And I have the perfect person to talk about our democracy and how we can make sure that it stays resilient and strong. My guest today is Vicki Hausman. She's the founder and co-CEO of Ford Majority, a super PAC that was founded in 2017 to elect reform-minded Democrats at the state level across the United States. A strategist and entrepreneur, Vicki has built her career at the intersection of business and social justice. Most recently, she was a partner with Dahlberg, where she led the firm's America business and its global health practice. Vicki started her career as a Peace Corps volunteer and was previously a consultant with the, Harvard, uh, with, with the Boston Consulting Group. I said Harvard there because she's a graduate of Harvard College, uh, so we know she's really smart and she's gonna teach us lots of stuff today. So welcome, Vicki. Hi, Patrick, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. All right, so I'm gonna put you on the hot spot to get going today. Uh, what is giving you FOMO right now? Yeah, um, lots of things. We are in the thick of campaign season, as I'm sure you know. Yes. This is a really busy time for me. Um, so the thing that's giving me the most FOMO is the giant stack of books I have at home that I haven't had time to read that are sitting next to my bed and calling my name for somewhere around November 7th. Now the really important question, the follow-up, natural follow-up question is, is one of those books the 10-person entrepreneur? Of course it is. Top of the stack. Nice. Top of the stack. Five. Uh -huh. Bam. Okay. Um, so, so I want to take, I want to start this conversation by going back to election night 2016. Uh, which was a historic night. A lot of change happened. Um, I don't remember much of it because after about 10 o'clock, I, you know, I sort of just like let the gin and tonic take over. <laughs> but, um, but that was a, a big night for you. Something changed for you that night. So take me back and tell me what happened. Yeah, so um, I mean, big picture context for me. Obviously, November 8th, 2016 is a night that will be etched in so many of our collective memories um, up there with 9-11 or the Challenger explosion or other punctuated moments in history where something just shifts for so many of us. Um, for me, as you mentioned, I'd been working at the intersection of business and social justice for all my career, um, had been really thinking about ways to address issues of global poverty, um, spent much of my professional life in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and working on issues of global health in particular. Um, I have three little boys, and I just had my third little boy, Julian, um, a couple months before the election, and had been um, working in global development for so long, felt like we'd made some really great progress, we'd helped grow this amazing firm, Dahlberg, um, and increasingly, my own interests had started shifted more and more domestically, and was excited to think about ways in which um, some of these huge issues of social mobility could be addressed through the types of models we've been using at Dahlberg. And um, I'd been thinking about issues like early childhood education, um, like criminal justice, like access to opportunity, and had arranged to take a sabbatical from Dahlberg and really think about how to shift into some of these domestic issues. And was doing my own little due diligence and thinking through like where the biggest points of leverage would be um, and this all happens right in the run-up to election night uh, 2016. And I remember sitting up and watching the returns roll in, like everybody else, the gin and tonic setting in for me as well, and just reaching a point pretty early on where I was like, I'm done, I can't watch it anymore. Going to sleep, um, really having this restless night uh, where I didn't sleep at all. And waking up the next morning, um, 
and just realizing not only had everything I'd assumed to be true about our politics and our democracy been called into question, but more broadly, these issues I'd gotten really excited about uh, shifting into domestically, and as well as the issues I'd been working on internationally, we're going to go absolutely nowhere until we fix our politics. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, before we even think about this crisis of democracy we face more broadly. Um, and I, I had this little two-month-old, Julian, and I remember holding him and also thinking, on a really personal note, um, you know, I just brought this baby into the world. I had three little boys, all under the age of six at the time. Um, and the things that we were witnessing unfold in front of our eyes were that which were going to affect their future in such a profound way. Um, so I decided right then I wanted to explore ways that I could make a pivot into this realm of politics and democracy and really figure out where my expertise and background might be useful in terms of starting to make change. It's very interesting because, you know, some people might hear this and say, why, how would you be applying lessons learned from Africa or South Asia in the United States, right? But, you know, my, you know, the reality is that we have certain challenges we're facing where we could learn things from other parts of the world. So you were doing that, and yeah. you were thinking about how to bring what you learn best practices back to U.S. Because there are things like infant mortality, mm -hmm. where we are ranking, you know, as the United States, when I say we, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're lagging. Not leading. Right, and so yeah. it's time for us to start thinking about actually, you know, how do we solve these problems? And so you were ready to do that. You shifted gears. You've kind of, you've kind of um, led up to this, but, you know, I, I want to get a really direct answer on this point. Yeah. What for you is at stake right now? I mean, I think very simply put, the actions that each of us take at this moment in time will have a disproportionate impact on the future of our country. There are no two ways about it. Um, so when I think about what's at stake and how I spend my time and energy and where I hope folks who are listening will spend their time and energy if they're not already, it's really digging in and figuring out ways to renew and fix our democracy and our politics. Um, and I can share more about what we've been doing at Ford Majority in that lens. Um, but I, I think similarly, building on your point, I know you and I both have background in uh, developing countries. Yeah, if we hadn't areas. met in New York City, we would have met in like, <laughs> I don't know, or Senegal somewhere. or something. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, but I actually thought about it and just this translation of global to domestic issues and increasingly of the work I've done globally into politics, um, less from a substantive perspective in terms of like what are the approaches that we could apply here, um, and more in terms of how we think about these big dysfunctional systems. Yes. Where I used to work was kind of foreign aid and global assistance, um, and there you have this huge bureaucracy with hundreds of billions of dollars flowing through, and yet the impact on people's lives is moderate to low at yes. best. Yes. And at times it's actually, you know, a negative impact in distorting markets and actually having adverse impacts. Um, so my my overall perspective in the work we've been doing at Dahlberg was very much looking at the system and starting to say, where are the biggest points of leverage that we can identify and activate and use those to try to drive change and start to overall increase the effectiveness and impact of the money that's going through the system. Um, so when I started to look in the political realm, I actually thought, you know, once again, we've got this big bureaucracy um, that has so much money going into not only campaigns, but our political system overall, and yet the overall utility and kind of impact that comes out of that is increasingly, <laughs> I guess, moderate to low at best right. again, right? And um, if anything, people are increasingly dissatisfied with democratic institutions. Yes. Um, and so the the heart of the problem is is really about how do we fix this system. Yeah, and it, it's, I will dig into this more, but as I hear you talk, I, I think many people would agree, and no matter where you come from on the political spectrum, so you had, you, ha, you have a particular political, um, you know, viewpoint on the world. Mm -hmm. I have a different one, you know, we overlap in a lot of ways, we probably are different in some ways, but regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, I think we can all agree that government is not doing enough for us. It's inefficient. There are problems. We are, you know, there's a, a, a just statistically, people are dissatisfied, mm. and that's leading to a lot of issues. And so, you know, as we come back to the way you look at the solutions, I'd love to know. So you, you okay? So you 
you wake up the next day, you're like, I'm gonna change this, yeah. you leave your job. So what did you identify as the solution? Yeah, well, well there you are know, many solutions, but the one that you wanted to focus on. Absolutely. Um, it wasn't obvious what, I don't think there are any easier answers, frankly. Um, and for me, as somebody who had not worked in politics at all, it wasn't obvious to me like where I would add value and where my expertise were relevant. Um, and so as I was transitioning out of Dahlberg, I started to do my own due diligence and really look around at the ecosystem and think about where the biggest leverage points for change are. The political are. ecosystem. The political yeah. ecosystem, exactly. Um, and, um, you know, as I started to look at where we were as a country in a democracy, um, it was struck by the fact that we increasingly have a one-party monopoly. Yeah. Um, we increasingly see that, uh, you know, the checks and balances that naturally would come through a two-party system don't exist if we have one-party power and one party that's out of power at almost every level of government. Um, I started to learn about state legislatures and was amazed at the power that is endowed in these small, fragmented, seemingly unimportant, frankly, uh, units of government. They're literally the state senate and state house in every single state. Um, I certainly wasn't paying any attention to them, but what became clear to me was that these state legislatures um, were ground zero in the gerrymandering that we see that's disenfranchising um, voters nationally and ground zero in voter suppression. Um, and I'll just give you two examples. In terms of gerrymandering, gerrymandering gets so much press lately. I mean, there was a lot of hope that the Supreme Court would take a ruling in Gill versus Whitford and strike down the gerrymandered maps that have been around for the past decade. State legislatures in the majority of states draw congressional lines, and they yes. draw state legislative lines as well. Um, with uh, you know overwhelming power in the states, Republican-held state legislatures drew lines a decade ago um, that have given Republicans an estimated 18 seats in Congress simply due to extreme partisan gerrymandering. Um, that is nearly the full 23-seat majority that Republicans have right now, yeah. um, just five seats shy of what we all think about in terms of winning back the House and putting a check on Trump's power. Um, so this is consequential, to say the least. Second piece um, is legal tactics of voter suppression, literally the laws that determine how people vote and who can vote. Um, and these are determined through the laws passed in individual states. And what we've seen is um, in 2013, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. And with that, there's been this unprecedented acceleration of laws to make it harder for people to vote, and which inherently disenfranchise um, Democrats more than they do Republicans. It's people of color, it's young people, it's less frequent voters, and those all tend to be Democrats. Um, and this is happening in states like Wisconsin, which Trump won by 22,000 votes. Right. Um, you know, he won Michigan by 11,000, Pennsylvania by 44,000. Had he not won those three states, he would not have won the Electoral College, and Hillary Clinton would be president. Um, so again, state legislatures have a huge amount of power that's not just affecting state policy, but also affecting these national outcomes that matter so much. Um, so it struck me that much like my work previously, state legislatures really represent um, one of these points of leverage in the system. And by breaking the overwhelming power that Republicans now hold, controlling two-thirds of state legislatures, having trifectas, meaning they control both chambers of a state legislature and the governor's seat in the majority of battleground states, um, there's an opportunity to address these issues of disenfranchisement. And this is so critical because even for somebody who's listening right now and saying, well, I'm a Republican, I'm fine with this. I want Republicans to own everything. The reality is competition makes everybody better. If you, know, if you think about industry and private industry and you have a monopoly yeah. that owns everything, they don't have to necessarily constantly improve to make their customers happy or to attract marginal customers. So in the political sphere, it's the same thing. We need multiple parties to compete with each other to come up with better ideas in the, in the, in the marketplace of ideas yep. and raise their game at all times. When you don't have proper competition, that can't happen. So, Yeah. Well, I would just, I would take it one step further. I think that the competition in the system is fundamental for us to produce better outputs, better ideas, just yes. as you said, to kind of 
also keep each other honest and really have accountability. Um, but what, when I think about our work, while we do have a partisan model and we are about winning democratic power that breaks this Republican stranglehold, um, I am not a hugely partisan person myself. Um, and if anything, I'm very moderate. And what I found is our work really resonates with moderates, with people who vote on you know, both sides of the aisle, if you will, and that this is really about fairness, and it's really about democracy. And unfortunately, given the state we're in right now, the only lever that's really at our disposal is this electoral partisan lever yes. that starts to change the system. Um, but my like, theory of change, if you will, for the long term is not about building democratic power. It's about addressing these inherent um, issues that are disenfranchising voters and that are leading to poorer outcomes overall in terms of representation. Totally agree. And I think you know, if you look at the statistics, some people are surprised to find out that only, I think, less than 50% of people are part of a party. The other half are independent, and they're looking for solutions that probably are in the middle of the road, but our system's not delivering those today. So creating a more competitive system also benefits all those people. Yeah, it does. And actually, one thing that's been really striking to me is I've gotten into the weeds of our work. And we're working right now um, to win back power and break the Republican stranglehold in these battleground states that have been the root drivers of gerrymandering and voter suppression. And with that, um, we run our own programs to persuade and motivate voters uh, to actually win races and win enough to win majorities. And what we've seen, and, and just thinking through you know, your point, what we've seen is while we live in this um, moment in time where partisanship is at an all-time high, we see that the people who are persuaded, the people who are moving, look like Republicans. You know what I mean? There's a huge amount of movement that I think is understated in the current political context. Yeah. We assume people are so far on the ideological spectrum and political spectrum that there's no potential for moderate bipartisanship. Um, and I think that's discounting the reality of how we see voters moving and getting stuck in the rules-based structures like gerrymandering that breed this political extremism and kind of reinforce and entrench ideas and entrench the overall political viewpoints. I love it. OK, so, yeah. so as we think about you, so you decided to do this, and you go to the local level. I'm curious. You know, I've gotten to know you a bit, and, and one thing I've learned about you is you're data-driven. You are somebody who likes to get into the numbers. And when I think about politics, uh, from a layman's perspective, I'm like, local politics, there probably is no data, <laughs> right? I mean, am I right? Or where did you get the information to come up with your thesis that you needed to get local? And how did you figure out how to mobilize at that level from an information perspective? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I do think there's like, you know, there's a reality that over the past 10 years, um, part of this landscape that we're looking at is Democrats were wiped out in the states. They lost about 1,000 seats, 27 state chambers. Um, and with that, you know, that's decimated a lot of the local state parties, and it's wiped out a lot of the infrastructure that existed and made it harder, frankly, to start to win. It makes it harder to fundraise, makes it harder to run good campaigns, makes it harder to recruit candidates. Um, obviously, 2018 is a different year, and it's a year in which there's been an outpouring of folks who want to run and attention from individuals who weren't engaged before. Um, but what we saw in the data was really striking. Um, we essentially saw a market failure. There are large swaths of competitive districts in the states that simply are not being contested by Democrats or whether they are contested, contested excuse me, and a Democrat runs, um, they're just not resourced in a way in which a kind of overall effective campaign can get out the message and actually um, connect with voters. Um, so we saw these huge disconnects. And I'll just give you an example. Um, we've been doing some work in Texas. And um, there's a district we've been looking at where Hillary won 49% uh, of the vote. So she didn't win the district, but she came really close. It's held by a Republican Pretty right now. Pretty close for Texas. Pretty close for Texas. Um, and the last Democrat who won for the State House seat there uh, got 43% of the vote. And he spent $6,000 on his campaign, which is like not wow. enough to buy a cup of coffee, as you right. know. Right. Um, and meanwhile, the Republican incumbent spent over $150,000. And so we look at a district like that, and the fundamentals are inherently pretty strong. 
Um, and so we see that as the type of district where we can invest, we can run our programs, and even smaller amounts of money can start to turn the tide and actually get these types of districts over the line. Um, the other thing we saw in the data was quite simply, Democrats aren't competing in enough seats to actually win majorities. Um, so we worked in Virginia last year. Uh, there were 17 seats that needed to flip from Republican to Democratic control to win the majority. And overwhelmingly, all of the attention and resources were only looking at 10 seats, right. which was inherently insufficient to win the majority in a state that Hillary Clinton had won in 2016. Um, so what we've seen is um, through data, we're able to surface additional races, put them in play, and play in a broad enough portfolio to actually make a run at the full majority to take control of the state house or the state senate. And so I'm running in Texas, mm -hmm. in that district you just, and I spent my $6,000, you come to me and you're just like, you identify me as this opportunity, I guess, mm -hmm. like I'm an arbitrage opportunity, potentially. Yeah. What do you give me for a majority? Yeah, well it's interesting, because of the way in which the campaign finance rules work, we play on what's called the independent side. Okay. So we aren't allowed to coordinate directly with the candidates. Oh, interesting. So what we do is you'd be running in this district, and we would come in and say, you know, you're running your campaign, you're spending your money on your cup of coffee in this case. <laughs> and um, we would take a look at your platform and anything you'd put out publicly, and we would create digital programs around that to amplify your messages. We'd also do opposition research, policy research. Um, we do issue testing to understand what messages are resonating with people, which issues are most salient. Um, and we'd build out a full digital program focused on persuading people in your district to vote for you. Um, and then we do a big turnout program, which is actually just about getting people to vote, yeah. um, letting them know, you know when the election day is. Um, there's some evidence-based messaging that actually motivates people to vote called social pressure. We end up using that. Um, and we essentially wrap our programs around what you would already be doing and try to get enough people to vote for you and to vote on election day to actually get you over the line. So you're kind of like my super fan that's out there cheering me on. <laughs> exactly. Looking at what that's I'm the doing. right analogy. Do you do this for podcasts as well? Because <laughs> I'd love to. Uh, totally. You know. Totally. I am your super fan. Thank you. So, I you know it's um, when I think about what you're doing, I call it political entrepreneurship. Which apparently I looked up the word political entrepreneurship and it means something totally different. Hmm. I, I can't remember right now, but yeah. it's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> Well, we can reclaim it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Let's yeah. own that phrase because it is, you're taking an entrepreneurial mindset to politics. Yeah. And you're kind of growth hacking for candidates. Um, and you need money to do that. So how much, I, I, if, if you can say, yeah. how much money have you raised and how did you do it? Yeah, you know, it, well, it's interesting. The whole political entrepreneurship phrase, I think, is something that um, we, you and I hadn't talked about this before, but we've thought about it a lot in our work and that, we haven't wanted to build like a new political organization or a big political committee. We've really thought about our work um, much more as like a scrappy startup and said, how do we build something lean and flexible and entrepreneurial that brings many more of like the business principles and attributes into how we think about building this organization and how we think about um, performance and results and everything else, ROI. Um, so we very much embrace that. Um, to date, we've raised uh, for this year um, around a million. Uh, excuse me, around eight million dollars. Eight million dollars, um, which we're putting all. I just want to stop. It. Just, state races. Let's yeah. just focus. Eight million dollars. Yeah, it's that really is a lot of <laughs> coffee. It's a lot of coffee. Wow, it's a lot of coffee. Um, you know, we started last year. We raised about a million for Virginia, which was our prototype. Um, we said, you know, let's kind of prototype, do proof of concept. Virginia was the only real kind of off-cycle election last year. And we put all of our money, literally like every cent of it, into a set of races everyone thought would be unwinnable. We said a little prayer. <laughs> the night before, I was like, I may not be able to like sit next to my friends or family at you know, a dinner party in the next few weeks if we lose. So I've asked everyone I know for money. Um, but with a little bit of luck and smart strategy, we were able to deliver. And with that proof of concept and with bringing a very different approach to these races, um, we literally build out investment theses for the individual targets we're looking at. Um, I think we've brought in a new set of political funders who think about their investments in a really different way. Um, we actually don't have most of the like traditional large-scale donors as our donors, but we've taken our work and said, um, you know, who thinks about 
investments in a way that would resonate with our work, where we have thought about return on investment, where we have thought about efficiency, where we have thought about just the ways in which we can deliver layers of impact um, for every dollar that we spend. Um, and then I do think also there's, there's a moment in time where people are motivated by patriotism and by democracy. And it's a really amazing silver lining given where we are as a country. Um, and hopefully is like the overall pivot point at which we can start to renew some of these bigger picture challenges that we face as a country. Now, you talked about patriotism. You talked about ideology and data. And it's an interesting thing because I don't consider myself particularly ideological. Hmm. I'm politically interested, but you know, I'm not sort of on the, you know, I'm not like running down the street protesting things every week. But some people really are ideological. That's part of our system and we encourage that. But how do you think about you know, what you're doing? Is it ideological? Is it data driven? Is it both? How do, how do you kind of parse that out? Yeah, well, it's, I think so many people that work in um, political campaigns come to these issues with an ideology of like, a, if not a litmus test, just certain issues of progressive politics or democratic politics or Republican politics that matter to them. Um, for me, I've, I've been fairly apolitical most of my life, to be honest. I kind of felt like our politics were fine. Right. And the issues that you I was- You didn't have to pay attention, did you? I felt like I didn't have to I pay didn't attention. I didn't either. And I'm that. probably part of the problem in that way. Um, but it, it felt to me like they were, they were dysfunctional, but they were also fine. Yeah. And that the bigger problems were, um, you know, in my case, these issues of kind of income inequality globally and global poverty and the things that I was really consumed in thinking about. Um, so I come to this with an idea, ideology that's just frankly about like the future of our country and the future of our democracy and recognizing that we are at an incredibly dangerous moment in time. Um, and I think the election of Donald Trump revealed the fragility of our democracy, uh, which has been both incredibly resilient, but also has critical challenges and risks. Um, and so that's been the headline for me. And the data and all of that is like a component of how we've thought about going after opportunities that can make a difference um, and that can address some of these fundamental challenges in terms of gerrymandering and voter suppression. But I'll just say, I mean, I think the other piece for me as on a personal note is um, so many of my professional choices and life choices have really been driven by people and by um, people I want to work with and people who compel me. Um, my co-founder is a guy named David Cohen, who's a longtime political operative, and he's a brilliant strategist, but he's also a, a great partner. And we've, I think, really um, enjoyed collaborating, building this out, and building out a team of others um, where we've brought in some top talent um, and been able to marry some of this data ideology of democracy, if you will, with just this ability to kind of innovate together and collaborate together. Okay, so take me, it's election night, what is it, November 8th this year? Right? Oh, oh my goodness, Patrick, come on. November 6th, November 7th. 6th, November 7th, November 6th. 6th. Okay, I'll be there. Everybody, it's November 6th. All right. Please vote. Yikes. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna take you to the polls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, be, I'll vote, don't worry. Um, but um, November 6th, election day. Yeah. Election night. Yes. Where are you going to be? Mm. Like, take us inside the bunker. What's yeah. going to be happening? Yeah. Well, I think I would be remiss not to share with you like a, a key message that I think about a, a lot before I take you into the bunker. Okay. Um, Get it done. Which is this. I think so much of the collective energy right now across the country has been focused on winning back the House. Yeah. Now there's even talk of winning back the Senate. Um, and it's really this notion of we must win a federal chamber if we hope to put a check on Donald Trump. Um, but I think one thing that's been revealed to me through our work that doesn't get enough attention is the fact that if we wake up on November 7th and we've won back a federal chamber, if we have not won back power in these states and broken the Republican stranglehold in battleground states like Florida, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, emerging battlegrounds like Arizona, 
it will be very hard to defeat Donald Trump in 2020. Okay. And it is more than likely that he will be reelected as it stands right now. Okay. Um, so people really need to be paying attention to these races and to what's happening in the states. Um, definitely vote on November 6th, but also pay attention to the states which are really the foundation of our democracy and really where so much of the national context and outcomes are determined. Um, in terms of the bunker, uh, I'll be with my team. We'll be pulled up in our office looking at all the returns coming in. Um, it's a bit nerve-wracking. Our model's inherently higher risk, higher reward, more aggressive targeting, going after some of the highest value turf that's just harder to win. And um, we're really bullish on the portfolio we put together. Um, and I think as soon as we get a sense for where we've been able to win and where we've been able to deliver, the big question becomes how do we translate that into an agenda on voting rights, on redistricting, on these issues of democracy where we now have an opportunity to start to drive things forward. Amazing. All right, so this is a show about finding the power to choose what you actually want uh -huh. and the courage to miss out on the rest. So for somebody who's sitting, listening to this and saying, I want to go out there and make a difference, I want to get involved in political issues, what is your advice to them? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, definitely just go for it. Um, you know, there's, there are a million different things that you can do to get involved and just rolling up your sleeves and trying out different things that might resonate with you is exactly the way to get started. As a baseline, vote um, and just start paying attention to these things like state legislatures that may have seemed inconsequential but are actually affecting your and my life in meaningful ways. Um, and from there, I think you know there's so many great new organizations, existing organizations that could really use volunteers and help. Um, so just try, try a few different things. And run for something. And run for something too, Run for exactly. something. Local politics needs people who it care. It does. They need diversity of ideas and opinions. It's a, such what this country a good is about. point. It's such a good point. Um, yeah, I think for folks who are listening who have been thinking about that, um, I think nothing can change our system more than having good leadership and having people with diverse uh, perspectives, backgrounds, and um, leadership capabilities stepping into the arena. And it's interesting because um, there's a professor named David Moss at Harvard Business School mm. who wrote a whole book about the fact that, and, I, and I'll get this wrong so you gotta read the book, but there's a point where the more differences you have between sides in a political system, the better outcomes you have because the systems, you may have very, you know, a lot of disagreement, but it forces compromise mm -hmm. um, if you have the right kind of people around the table. So. We, we want a diversity of ideas at the table, but we need a system that's fair so that those ideas are included. Yep. All right, Vicki, um, where can people find out more about you and about Forum Majority? Yeah, so the, the best place to go is our website. Um, it's really simply forwardmajority.org, um, which outlines the work that we're doing. Uh, you could sign up for our email list and um, shares overall our uh, thesis on state legislatures and our model that we're um, rolling out right now. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to shift to the faux moment of the week. That is the moment of the week that gave me most FOMO or that provided an insight about how FOMO is playing out in our culture. And I had one, but I'm going to throw it out the window because the reason I know Vicky is that we're both involved in a nonpartisan political organization called the Leadership Now Project. And it's just a group of people who are business people who are getting together to find ways to make our democracy work better. And a couple weeks ago, we all convened on the, the campus of Harvard Business School, the place where FOMO was born, the place where I wrote the first article about FOMO. And I thought to myself, you know, it's been over 10 years. I'm over my FOMO. And I'm going to tell you something. A couple days back there, I was running around with my head cut off, trying to do everything, trying to see everybody. And I realized that for me, that place is a trigger. My FOMO comes back like it never had gone away. And so as you think about your own FOMO, even if you think you beat it, uh, you're always at risk of getting back into it and basically realizing that it's very difficult to completely and totally overcome it. And I want to thank you all for joining me today. Uh, this has been a really great discussion. I'm very passionate about politics. I'm also passionate about entrepreneurship, political or otherwise. So if you want to read more about uh, FOMO sapiens, 10% entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in general, you can go to my website, 
patrickmcginnis.com where you will find information about all of those things and links to my social where if you want to find more about any of the things that I do, you will not be disappointed. So check out the site, take care of yourselves, and I will see you next time on FOMO Sapiens.